Uh, my name is Guy Newey. I'm a research fellow at Policy Exchange in the Energy and Environment Unit. Um, welcome to the, at the last count, uh, 150th event linked to electricity market reforms at the start of the year. Um, I'm sure lots of you have breakfasted, lunched, and suffered your way through this issue. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, it's great to see such a, uh, a, a good turnout at this stage of the uh, consultation process. Um, as we all know, in December, the government published a set of proposals on reforming the electricity market. The aims, keep the lights on, decarbonize electricity, electricity generation, and keep bills as low as possible. So quite a lot to do in, uh, in the legislation. Um, some have welcomed the proposals as giving the certainty for investors to deliver the carbon emissions targets. Some have disagreed with that point of view and argued that the reform package could sweep away the competitive <coughs> market as we know it. Tonight we hope to get to the bottom of some of those issues. Um, and we've got an excellent panel with which to discuss them. Um, unfortunately, Jonathan uh, Brilly is unable to make it this evening, but in his place we have the next best thing. <laughs> is Deputy Richard Sargent on my far right. Uh, Richard's career has spanned Treasury, where he was involved in the uh, Gower's review on intellectual property uh, before taking up a role in Google. He returned to central government with DEC, where he's now uh, Deputy Director of Energy Strategy and Futures, and obviously has close responsibility for the policy we're all discussing this evening. Um, on my far left is Professor George Yarrow, who's Chairman of the Regulatory Policy Institute at Oxford. Um, George is a distinguished expert in competition and regulation policy, in particular the energy market. Um, as well as his academic work, he's been involved in many uh, public and private sector roles, including on the board of Ofgem. On my right is Simon Skillings, who uh, has 25 years experience in the energy industry, including as Director of Strategy and Energy Policy at E.ON UK. He now works as Senior Associate at E3G and runs his own consultancy for Trilemma UK. On my left is another Simon, Simon Less, who is the Research Director in the uh, Policy Exchanges Environment and Energy Unit. He previously headed Energy Policy at the Treasury and was the Director of OPWAT. He is the author of Policy Exchanges recent report which is called Remonopolizing Power, question mark, 10 Principles of Electricity Market Re Reform. Um, the way this evening is going to work, each panelist will, spark, will speak for 10 minutes or so, um, which will leave us with plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, we're hoping to wrap up for 7.45 finish. Um, one housekeeping rule beyond turning off your mobile. Tonight's event is under Chatham House rules. Um, so I'll start by asking Richard to present first. I'll now invite Professor Yarrow to... Uh, to... Thank you. Um, as, uh, over the weekend, I was driving up to, uh, to County Durham uh, with my youngest in tow, Catherine and I uh, was uh, having to listen, as usual, to all the CD that, uh, teen C CDs that uh, teenage children prepare for these things. Um, and somewhere, somewhere well to the north, we got through to a disc which was labelled uh, Car Journey Mix 3, something made by Catherine's elder brother, Tom, who has rather bizarre and eclectic tastes in music. Anyway, it was playing through and there were the usual rock songs and then all of a sudden uh, we went back to the 1930s and uh, playing an original version of As Time Goes By. And I thought, there we are, I have the theme for, 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 for next Thursday. <laughs> the fundamental things apply as time goes by. <laughs> so that's, that's what I'm going to focus on. The alternative, this is the secular version, the alternative would have been a Northern Saints theme, Aidan Mead and Cuthbert, so the ABCs of energy economics. Um, this is, this is <laughs> the fundamental principles. Um, what I'd like to do is just, just set out, I mean, obviously in a few minutes, can't go through all the, um, the principles of economics as they might apply 
in these markets. But let me just pick out four things, um, all of which I think are very relevant to uh, the way in which we look at these problems. The first is um, almost very fundamental, right back to the beginning of our subject. Monopoly is a very poor form of resource allocation. It's a very weak mechanism. It's weak for a number of reasons, um, but when I'm giving an account of it, I always say it has three major defects. It handles large quantities of information and uncertainty very poorly because monopoly involves limited channel capacity for processing information. If you think in the limit, the single, the single processor makes the decision. Compared with competitive markets, which are multi-channel information processing systems. Second, it lacks incentives. So the monopolist just doesn't have the same incentive, particularly to innovate, that you get in competitive markets. In a competitive market, if you don't innovate, you can be wiped out. And that makes innovation a necessity. And as you all know, necessity is the mother of invention. So that's its second uh, defect. Its the third defect is that monopoly is a form of power, and all power is associated with abuse of power, the almost universal. So um, you can do all that fairly technically, the first two points, um, we talk about information and incentives, which is what every microeconomist does, and you have lots of equations. The third one, abuse of power is a principle of competition policy. It's uh, in the European Treaty, it's one of our fundamental principles. But in summary, monopoly has tendencies to be stupid, lazy, and corrupt. That's the kind of demotic uh, summary of its characteristics or the tendencies. And um, that's well attested empirically. You can switch the tally on tonight and see examples of monopolistic political regimes where you see all three of those qualities visibly on display in front of your very eyes. So these are not abstract theoretical groups. They occur at smaller levels, um, where you've got less power, obviously, less, less monopoly power, but you can see them um, throughout. Second point is that nobody in economics, as far as I can see through the classical period at least, was ever terribly enthusiastic about the properties of competition. Nobody claimed that competition was virtuous. The claim was and is that what competition does, it allows you to avoid the evils of monopoly. So uh, it's not particularly um, virtuous, uh, but it prevents the much greater evils of monopoly. Connected with that, an empirical point, which I think is fundamental to the context, We've been able to move away from monopoly in the electricity sector largely because of technological developments and technological capabilities. That fundamental will continue to apply. Those, those processes continue, those technologies develop, and I think it's quite clear that if we persist, the best of competition is yet to come, um, particularly at the retail level. So the trend that gives us, that allowed us to do all the experiments with competition, to be world pioneers as we have been since the late 80s, thanks to many people in this room, um, the fundamentals haven't changed. Um, and the merits of the competitive solutions relative to a monopoly, if anything, are increasing over time. Third fundamental, markets handle most types of risk pretty well. So, uh, be skeptical when you hear arguments about markets nearing, needing price stability. I think all those points are, are arguable. If you believe, for example, that energy prices have negative systematic risk because high energy prices tend to be associated with periods of stock market depression. In fact, the cost of capital on our standard model is lower if you don't give renewables hedges. It goes the other way around. So there are lots of empirical assumptions being made about people, when people are making statements about comparative risks, which really should be tested out. But the one form of risk that the markets don't handle well, and it's because it's a monopolistic risk, is regulatory and political risk. It's very difficult to hedge against. Um, and it's to do partly with the arbitrariness of the exercise of market power. My fourth fundamental, fundamental which I think applies is this is a global problem and therefore you would expect when anybody's talking about contributions to solutions you would expect to hear a lot about comparative advantage where is it that britain can make its biggest comparative 
contribution to the global problem. We tend not to hear that. It tends to be a kind of little England or little Britain approach about targets and our targets and fulfilling those. One of the great contributions we've made over the past 20 years has been exactly our experimentation and our development of competitive markets. Not many people have done that. Those that have, principally in places like Australia, um, you know, that, that, that has been their contribution and very, there's very little information on how to do it and yet if you believe that competitive markets are capable of delivering large savings and doing things in a more productive way, that is potentially a big and important way of making a contribution to the global problem, which we neglect. Now, how does that relate to um, the EMR as it stands at the moment? I think there should be no doubt that the policy at the moment is moving back towards monopoly, the, the words of Simon's excellent uh, paper we've seen the remonopolization uh, of power you can see that in a number of ways if you go back to the coalition agreement and see the three principles carbon floor price price fixing contracts for differences okay well uh, that could be price fixing or you could have auctions but again, make no mistake that when you've got the auctions that we're talking about, although you're getting competition and more competition, and the solution, the CFD solution with auctions is probably better than the one without it. In fact, it's something, the, the last time I responded to a consultation in this area was four years ago, and it recommended exactly that, because it will save 100 million or two. But you've still got monopoly on one side of the market. Don't pretend that this is anything like a competitive market. Competitive markets typically have double-sided auctions, if you're thinking of them in terms of the, 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 the auction scenario. And then the third one are the, um, the, the requirements in terms of coal fire stations. So all of those things are representing um, increasingly intrusive um, interventions where the, what's happening in the market is being influenced more and more by those policy decisions which are made by a monopolistic um, policy uh, process and less and less, less by the many decision makers who influence outcomes in competitive markets. It's slightly odd, I mean we, 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 the, the Labour Party nowadays is moving back away from New Labour. Labour used to say, New Labour used to say, not for the few, for the many. Competitive markets are decision making by the many, monopolies are decision making by the few. Uh, and it's difficult to see why there is such a and enthusiasm for it in uh, current circumstances. Let me just take one of the more specific areas, um, just so that it's not all at a very high level of generality, uh, and take capacity payments. Uh, these were things we had in the pool. Um, they were done away with in the electricity market reforms. Mm -hmm. They're now coming back, but I suspect they're coming back in a different way. Um, let me just read you something that is said in the EMA, EMA which, uh, which kind of tells the story. It, this is of capacity payments. In effect, this transfers the management of the risk associated with underestimating capacity requirements to the government from market participants. So it's transferring responsibility from the market to government for this crucial assessment of capacity at the peak. That's effectively the nationalization or the renationalization of the peak supplies. It is also, in economic terms, it injects a large dose of moral hazard into the system at the peak. And it's at the peak that security supply issues are at their most substantive. So, it, it, it appears, you know, looking at it, if you're looking at it from a Martian, that we haven't learned enough from the uh, banking crisis and the difficulties of handling these kind of responsibilities of systems under stress. Uh, we're actually moving backwards in the energy market on these proposals to inject an element of the same kind of thing in economic terms back into the market with government serving, in a sense, as lender of last resort to uh, the, to, to the market. So, as you go through the detail, I mean, all of these things are not settled yet, but there are all sorts of warning signs 
uh, that um, we're, we're seeing backward movements. And precisely, to go back to the monopoly point, precisely because it depends upon fewer decisions, it takes account of less information, there's less diversity and influence on market outcomes. Monopoly is inherently more risky as a system than competitive markets. Competitive markets are more like biodiversity. They have lots of alternatives. People are doing different things. Um, whereas once you start centralizing, you start channeling down and um, putting your system uh, more and more at risk. Again, that's a theoretical point, but you've only got to look again at the evidence and ask yourself, when was the last time that there were major power failures and cuts in the UK? And you will see in the last two, the last two major incidents in the 1980s and in the 1970s, we were operating with monopolistic systems. And those failures of security of supply were intimately connected with the monopolistic nature of the, of the, of the relationships. I think the best that I would say of the, um, the document itself is that many of these problems are recognised in it, but it, it has all the all marks of a, a modern economic, uh, a modern government document, in the problems are noted and then simply dropped. It's as if they would have never been there. So somebody has said, we've got a box to tick, we'd better make sure that we let people know we've considered X, Y, Z. I've seen this done, being there at the drafting. And so it all goes in, but it, it just sits there uh, and is then ignored. So the document recognises regulatory risk, although it fails to spot that the whole process is introducing more and more of exactly the kind of risk that markets can't handle, regulatory risk and political risk. It also has the moral hazard um, issue recognised. It's cutely called the slippery slope um, in, 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 in the document. But if you look at the slippery slope section, that is about moral hazard. It mentions rent seeking, which is one of the, um, the defects of monopoly. Um, that uh, monopolistic systems tend to be very concerned about distribution of resources and about conflicts over rents rather than producing new things and doing things better. That's recognized, <coughs> but at each point, none of the fundamentals which should be applied are developed and applied. So um, one fears uh, in the long term that since the neglect of the fundamentals <coughs> won't change them, they will still continue to apply. Uh, what we're likely to see on the present course is the old unintended consequences. Uh, there are good intentions all around, I don't doubt that, um, but the analysis and level of um, understanding of the relationships within these complex systems uh, is, is simply um, not being exhibited sufficiently, I think, at the moment to have any confidence that these things are going to turn out well. The last point, I suppose, the last question, and I'll, I'll pass on because we have limited time, is, well, that's all very well and good, but can you deliver on uh, a decarbonisation agenda uh, through uh, a more competitive approach? And I think the answer to that is yes, you deliver on it much better and much quicker and um, uh, much less cost in a much less costly way, because competition is at its greatest, its greatest advantage relative to monopoly is innovation and in handling uncertainty and adaptation. And uncertainty and adaptation of what problems we face. We need a lot of innovation. And uh, uh, my view is that the, 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 the history, the economic history of uh, the last 250 years <coughs> would point me clearly to a competitive solution. As to the means, the simplest means would be if you think the EU is too, it's too weak, <coughs> simply supplement it with a, a Brit ETS with tighter carbon targets and require people to have two certificates, uh, build on what you've got. Will it hit the targets? Of course it will. The criticisms of the ETS are not that the targets are not being hit, it's that the price is too low. <coughs> well, that's a bit daft because if you can your targets at a lower price, it means you've done it less costly, in a less costly way. So we seem to be in a terrible model that we, we, we need very high prices. We only need very high prices if we can't get the innovations, it gets the cost of decarbonisation down. If you can get the cost of decarbonisation down, the carbon price will fall, and you will hit targets at lower prices. So, if you want to hit targets, if targets are the thing, then just set them, set the quantities, and let, let the, the rest of the market do its stuff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Yarrow.
And then we have certain skillings to, uh, to adjust this. Mm. If you'll uh, forgive me while I fiddle under the left hand for a minute. I have to say, I'm really looking forward to the, uh, the Q&A. Now, I know that, um, that you're all undoubtedly keen followers of morning television on ITV and enjoy a, a nice, simple, multiple choice question. So I will give you one of those to start with. You can be mulling over as we go through the talk. And this is about uh, a problem at home your boiler has given up the ghost. Now you have three options for your first action. Okay. Option one is you decide on your replacement heating system. Option two, you go out and appoint a plumber. Option three, you buy a toolkit. Okay? Now I'd like you to think about that whilst I'm talking. We'll come back at the end of my slot. Now I'm going to launch from that into some economics, which I must admit I'm feeling extremely wary of doing, having followed Professor Yarrow, who's uh, an incomparably greater knowledge of economics than my own is probably going to be manifest. But I actually think that uh, the comment I'm going to make uh, ties in exactly with, with, with what George was saying. Um, and what I'm trying to do here is move away from what I think is a rather sterile and, 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 and non-debate about markets versus regulation. It seems to me, you know, that that, that is just a, 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 a obvious answer. You have a market solution unless a market solution is clearly inappropriate, and then you try and choose the regulatory uh, solution that uh, causes these problems. Um, so, what is the market problem? What is the, what is the market problem that lies behind the EMR? Now, my view is that it is this. It is, the, it is what I'm trying to illustrate with this picture. And that is, um, uh, uh, I, I think, an observable feature of financial markets at the moment. Um, and that is that as the risk of an investment increases, then clearly the required return also increases. But what we are seeing at the moment is there is a point beyond which they simply will not go. Doesn't matter what you do with the return, they are not going there. Yeah? The money is not up here. Now, um, this is obviously a highly schematic picture um, and if we're operating in the sort of lower left-hand side, there really isn't a problem. If we're operating in the upper right-hand side, we have a big problem. And if we look at the electricity market at the moment, there are a series of risks. Now, some of them are traditional risks, commodity price risks, to some, to some degree, technology, performance, and deployment. I actually think those are greater risks now than they have been previously because of the new technologies that are involved. But as, again, as George pointed out, the massive, the massive risk that lies behind all of this is the policy risk and the long-term policy risk and the huge uncertainty that lies within people's minds about not only the level of ambition in terms of carbon reductions out in the longer term, but also technology and technology choices. They create huge risks for anyone making a long-term investment now. So, what would happen if there was no intervention? Well, an investor would simply wait until the range of policy options that were available, the range of outcomes um, that could occur, reduces to a point that the risk is acceptable. Um, now, in common lingo, people talk about that as build gas. Yeah. Wait and build gas. And what you do in that situation 
is you forego options, policy options for the future. You potentially forego the ability to achieve lower carbon futures. You potentially lock yourself in to much higher cost outcomes. So that, to my mind, is the theoretical underpinning, as I understand it, and I must say this is my view, I'm probably fine, lots of other views, of EMR. So what is it? The essence of EMR is to intervene in the market to transfer risk directly from investors to consumers. How? Through signing long-term contracts. And why? To preserve the policy options and avoid locking to high cost futures. Now, I recognize that the EMR proposals have got other elements to it. There's the carbon price support. I think most of us know why that's there. Um, capacity mechanism. Again, um, it, it's to some degree, there's a similar rationale that could underpin the capacity mechanism, uh, but slightly different. Um, and the emissions performance standard. But to my mind, the essence of the EMR is the long-term contract and the transfer of risk from investors to customers. Now, the moment you buy into the middle box there, you have crossed a very, very significant Rubicon. And two rather difficult and uncomfortable questions immediately emerge. Firstly, who decides which contracts to sign? And secondly, how do they decide which contracts to sign? Now these, to my mind, seem rather important questions um, and maybe, maybe they have been debated extensively in the previous 149 sessions. Um, but I've not been party to those debates, but they seem to me to be really rather important. And now, the, the, the underpinning policy dilemma um, is, is to try and define long-term um, objectives which deliver investment certainty. Now, there's a, there's a trade-off here. There's a trade-off between actually creating the long-term certainty that enables investors to have the confidence to line up um, the supply chains to fulfill a long-term market need, on the one hand, and on the other hand, not having something which is so incredible that people just discount it because they do not believe it to be affordable in the long term. Yeah. Very, very important um, core to the policy debate which needs to underpin EMR, again, I'm not aware that that is a debate that is being had and is being had extensively. What may flow from that in terms of policy is really quite a range of things. Um, and it's quite important where we end up on, uh, on, on, on this issue. Now what I've done is I've set up a, 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 a spectrum for where policy might land. At one extreme, it might say, look, all we're interested in doing is getting a first-of-a-kind nuclear away. That's all we're interested in. Yeah, the rest of it, can carry on. Um, on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, what we might say, well, actually, what we're trying to do is we're trying to deliver a particular volume of low-carbon energy resources out to 2030. We want particular minimum levels of, of individual technologies because we want to drive innovation in those technologies. And the residual we want to make sure we do in the least cost way. That's rather different. Yeah. And to my mind, there is a, a vast well, there are a vast range of intermediate points, and that creates a huge spectrum. Um, if you are on that side, your left-hand side looking at it, um, you can proceed, I think, broadly along the lines that the, the current EMR consultation uh, is following, uh, which is looking at um, some, some mechanisms. They will then be taken forward by government, and, 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 and off we go. If we're all towards the right-hand side, of this spectrum, um, then what follows from that is the need to establish new institutions. 
And the moment we decide that that is the world we are in, then the whole nature of the EMR debate seems to me to change. The, the discussion is no longer about detailed instruments. It becomes something very different. The EMR decision in a world in which institutions are prepared seems to me to have two key elements to it. Firstly, which actions for that institution should be prescribed in advance by the government as a feature of policy? Yeah. And which are the residual actions for which the institution has the flexibility to decide on its course of action against some overriding objective. Typically, you know, can that institution explore a range of different ways of sharing risk between customer and in, in investor for <coughs> customer value? Not un unlike the sort of thing that, 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 that Ofgem does as part of its network um, regulation. So, just for example, an EMR decision in an institution's world may prescribe which technology should be subsidised, it may prescribe maximum levels of subsidies. Those would seem to be things which are features of policy um, and should be determined in advance. Um, but there are other things that one would expect to be left to the auspices of a competent authority, um, perhaps seeking out new providers of low carbon resources. Um, and I mean, this isn't the, the subject of what I'm talking about today, but I think within this point, we have the key to unlock the demand side of the market. And we really do have an opportunity, if we are going down this route, um, to actually um, create a governance framework for an institution that is there actively seeking out alternatives to supply side solutions. But most importantly, one would expect that institution to explore innovative ways of, um, of sharing risk and exploring innovative contractual arrangements. So it does seem to me rather unlikely that in this world, an EMR decision would involve a prescribed form of contract, a CFD or a feed into. I have no idea whether they are the best way of meeting a policy, which I do not know what that policy is, and I do not know enough about the providers of those resources to know whether they are the best way of effectively reducing risk and sharing risk with customers. Yeah. I think you might be able to say, if all you want to do is build a nuclear power station, that you might be able to say in advance, yeah, that's the extreme. Yeah. But if you want to do something rather broader than that, I don't quite see how that can be achieved. So, coming back, we've had time to think about it. Um, I will give you my answer, my view, is that you probably need to decide on your replacement heating system first. Maybe in consultation with a competent plumber, um, but you may have a different view to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And now, the other side. Right, the, the problem with going uh, fourth is that uh, you run the risk of saying the same things as the previous speakers, but not as well. Um, so, but I, 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 nevertheless, I'm going to, I, I haven't got a PowerPoint patch, just the slide, fortunately, and I'm going to run through those five points briefly so that we can get on to questions. Um, as George has already said, um, or alluded to, <coughs> the UK electricity system accounts for less than 1% of global carbon emissions. So the main way in which the process of decarbonising UK electricity can have a global impact on climate change is through setting a, uh, a good example to others. And a compelling example is one which showcases um, 
the ways and the processes to decarbonize at minimum cost. So how we go about decarbonizing is at least as important, probably more important, than precisely when we decarbonize the electricity <coughs> sector. So in terms of this how, what are the right sort of processes? Well, they, they need to involve effective markets. I'm with George on that. Um, and for the reasons that he set out, a mar an effective market will identify the best ways for us to decarbonize successfully. Um, and markets are able, where they're allowed to, to um, adapt to the sorts of changes that uh, the process of decarbonization um, is going to throw at electricity. To take the example of the gas market in the UK, where there's, it's going through a massive change, where gas from the North Sea is declining rapidly, and the gas market has been able to adapt to that, to bring forward an enormous amount of new investment in infrastructure, particularly LNG input infrastructure, um, on a very timely basis, well ahead of time. Policy interventions to promote decarbonisation need to complement these market processes and not to replace them so that we can exploit the power of markets to, um, to deliver. Now my criticism of the um, EMR package is that it reduces markets flexibility unnecessarily re-monopolising what were market decisions and bring them into government. That it will continue and probably increase the political and regulatory uncertainty that is there in the market and that it misallocates a set of risks onto customers. Now the, the contract for difference, the FIT mechanism in particular, um, will unnecessarily but definitely lead the government in taking a whole range of detailed decisions about what the electricity capacity needs to be, about the timing of bringing forward that capacity, what the technology of that capacity should be, and what the price that we should pay for it should be. Um, I don't believe that it's possible, as the EMR document suggests, that, um, this, that having a CFD is compatible with some sort of middle ground where you can have that, all of that and you can still have competitive processes delivering benefits. And I don't, for example, believe that you can have technology neutral options uh, in practice in, in this area, not to a great degree. So this is a substantial move towards central planning, as George has already set out. And in, if we were to embark on this, we lose the benefits of markets that, again, George has set out. Governments, the government is likely to get the decisions wrong. Customers will pay more than they need to. Um, there'll be fewer mechanisms to correct mistakes and to adapt. And there'll probably be fewer incentives for innovation because fixed prices cap the upside for people trying to innovate. And, and um, another point again about leading to continued regulatory uncertainty because, precisely because the government is going to have to take all these decisions on an ongoing basis every year and so therefore there'll be a sort of recipe for ongoing political uncertainty. Um, the package <coughs> approach to reducing risks is to, as Richard set out, fix long-term electricity prices for low carbon generation. And this has the effect of transferring risks away from <coughs> investors and companies and onto customers. Customers will be insuring investors effectively against future changes. So changes in fossil fuel prices or new technological developments. If the gas price turns out to be lower than expected, customers won't benefit from that. Uh, they'll still pay high electricity prices. This is transferring risk away from those able to, or best able, to forecast and to manage those risks and to people who are unable to. Um, so we would, as a result, we would expect the overall costs of decarbonising to be higher under such an approach. So why is it that DEX consultation finds that the costs of their proposed package is lower? Um, well, it's because if it, the cost-benefit analysis only looks at the effect on the cost of capital. If you transfer risks away from companies and investors, yes, unsurprisingly, the cost of capital falls. But that's not the only element in looking at the cost of, um, of decarbonizing the electricity sector. It matters what you apply the cost of capital to. It matters what the cost of what you're building is, your choice of what you're building. So for example, to take a current example, we are building a lot of offshore wind to meet the 2020 carbon 
target. Uh, we're doing that instead of building a mixture of uh, gas, uh, onshore wind, biomass, and other less expensive technologies. And that has a huge extra cost. So that's an example of what you choose to build can have at least a big, or perhaps a bigger impact on what the overall costs are than the cost of capital. Um, and under the CFD approach, the increased risks from such choices, <coughs> from such choices are passed on to customers, um, and they're also hidden in the cost-benefit analysis. Market players need to carry these risks if, um, if the choices about what they build and operate are the, the cost of that is to be minimised. So what, what should the electricity market reform look like instead? Um, I think it needs to be, importantly, it needs to be simpler. We need to minimise the number of ongoing decisions that the government should be taking. In particular, it needs to be as technology neutral as possible. It needs to provide, through doing so, stability and minimising political uncertainty going forward. And a key part of that is getting a credible long-term carbon pricing framework within which markets can operate flexibly. Um, now the proposal for the carbon pricing support is one route to this. It's a reasonable second best um, if we cannot improve the European emissions trading system. Um, but Dan argues that, it's, that the CPS, the carbon price support, is, not, is insufficient because investors will discount what the Treasury says about what the future carbon price will be in 2020 or 2030. So it's surprising that the, the government hasn't looked closer at ways to address that particular problem, how to increase the bankability of the future carbon price. And there's a couple of options that I can think of. Um, one is to um, offer contracts, a contract for difference, not around the whole electricity price, but around the carbon price. Um, so this is directly focusing on the source of political uncertainty, the carbon price. So for example, a contract where the generator might say the Treasury is telling the truth when it says the carbon price support mechanism will get you £70 in 2030. Um, another, another objective, if, 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 another way of doing a bank, of improving the bankability is if, if, and this is particularly if <coughs> achieving a particular level of carbon emissions by a particular date in the electricity sector is paramount, is to have an electricity, a UK electricity carbon cap, one that delivers you the level of carbon you require in 2030, that could be through a sub cap to the EU ETS or through some form of obligation on suppliers. On top of the carbon pricing, any other necessary interventions ought to be surgical, focused on where there genuinely are risks that mean the market will not invest even with an effective carbon pricing framework. So this might be supporting early stage technologies. Um, renewable, early stage renewables, or perhaps contracting with the first of a kind new nuclear and first of a kind CCS. But any interventions like this need to be limited, targeted, time limited, and they shouldn't become the market. And this is where, this is in the way that the CFD proposal is becoming the entire, or would become the entire market. So to conclude, I think we're facing a choice should we exploit the power of markets to discover the best approaches to decarbonising the electricity sector? Or are we going to re-monopolise the power market and bring decisions to government with, I think, major costs to customers and also risks to achieving decarbonisation?